from home if you're watching from home as we live stream this morning I encourage you to be a part of our services whenever you can I hate to break up good fellowship but we can start it again afterwards we have a try to stay on time here encourage you to be part of the worship today if you uh, need anything afterwards please let us know We'll begin with uh, a song service. Oh, for a faith that will not shrink, though pressed by every foe, oh, that Happy New Year also. 
We have some folks back with us today. If you haven't looked over here on this side of the thing, we have a young lady who's back from uh, several things, so talk to her. We haven't seen her for a while. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we approach your throne thanking you for the blessings of this day. We thank you for being here with us, that we've come together in fellowship in your Son. Heavenly Father, we praise your name in your Son and the things that she has done for us. The teaching, the sacrifice, the example. And Heavenly Father, bringing us here this day to worship you. We gather here, Heavenly Father, with those blessings this season that we have been through, the time of sharing, of family. Heavenly Father, we thank you. You bless us in the ways of our living. You give us a job to go to each day. And in that, we might be able to serve you. And with that job, we help others. And Heavenly Father, we pray that we can continue to bring the gospel to the world, that we step out. We don't have to step across a country border, but we can step across our neighbor's yard and let us do that, that we talk to those about the gospel. Heavenly Father, watch over the works we do here at this place in this congregation in Lovemorth, that we can bless our neighbors that are around us in our community, that we can bring the word and Heavenly Father to help those. If they need a drink of water, Heavenly Father, we can step and do that. If they need shelter, we are here. If they need clothing, let us do those things. Heavenly Father, you've given us so many examples. We thank you because we can look at those each day and we can actually understand how we're supposed to live, that we can use those examples to teach ourselves. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can bring our children, that we can teach them and be free in this country. That blessing, Heavenly Father, comes from you. Be with us, Heavenly Father, as we worship you this morning. The word being preached, the words that are being read, Heavenly Father, the songs that we sing, that we bring glory to you only. Let us concentrate on you. Let us push out the world from this place. And Heavenly Father, we pray that you forgive our sins because we do those things we do not recognize. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for that forgiveness that we can approach you knowing that the Spirit will carry our prayers and he will intercede when necessary. Heavenly Father, be with us as we partake of the bread and the fruit of the vine, remembering Jesus on the cross. And Heavenly Father, we thank you for that blessing. Be with us in this new year as we end 2023 and the struggles and the work that we did there, Heavenly Father, that you bring us into a new year, that we continue that work and the struggles are less. Be with us this day. And we pray for all those who are away from us. We especially pray for our prayer list, Heavenly Father, that you watch over and heal and strengthen and raise up those who are weak. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Good morning. Does everyone have a communion set? Before we take a Lord's Supper, I'll read these scriptures reminding us Jesus, the Son of God, took on flesh and blood to be like us. First scripture is Matthew 2, verse 1 through 2, describing Jesus' birth. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, a wise man from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen him star in the east and have come to worship him. The second scripture showing Jesus' compassion is John 11, verse 35. Jesus wept. The third scripture is showing Jesus was tired is Matthew 8, verses 23 to 24. Now when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him, and suddenly a great tempest arose on the sea, so that the boat was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. The fourth scripture describes Jesus experiencing sorrow in Mark uh, verse 14, or chapter 14. Then they came to a place which was called Gethsemane, and he said to the disciples, sit here while I pray. And he took Peter, James, and John with him, and he began to be troubled and deeply distressed. He said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Sit here and watch. He went a little further and fell on the ground and prayed that, if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. The fifth scripture describes Jesus' distress at being separated from God because he had become sin for all mankind in Mark 15, verse 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabatine, which is translated, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the sixth and last scripture describing Jesus' death is Mark 15, verse 37. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Jesus answered the Lord's Supper to remind us today why he took on flesh and blood, as Matthew wrote in chapter 26, verse 26 through 28. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take it, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many, for remission of sins. Please all forgive thanks for the bread. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning as your children, Lord, giving you all praise and glory for, all, for, the, for that mercy, Father, and for that Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life on the cross for our sins, Lord. This bread represents his body that hung on the cross, Father, to pay our faithful price for our sins, which is death, Father. Please bless this bread and bless us as we take it. For Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's continue in prayer. Father, we take of this cup, which represents your son's shed blood. Father realizes that blood that, that seals us, Father, and the promise that you've made with, with us, Father, that if we're faithful to death, Father, that one day we've been having with you, Lord. Father, bless, bless us, us, and bless us as we take of it. Please just name we pray. Amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper for convenience at this time. Uh, we give a thank for the offering, and if anyone wishes to give, there's the box on the table in the back. Let's give thanks. Father, it's time. We thank you for all that blessings, Father, that you've given us more than we deserve, Father. Father, realize that all that we have comes from you. Father, you've given us our best in your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, help us to give back to you as you've blessed us. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Let the beauty of Jesus be saved.
I think that scripture is uh, left from last week. The reading we have today is from John chapter 4, verses 19 through 26. The, wo the woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, and the Jews say in Jerusalem is the place where one ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will neither worship in the mountain nor in Jerusalem to worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We know what to worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour is coming now when the, hour, when the true worshipers and worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is a spirit. God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am him. Good morning. Good morning. Tommy read is from John chapter 4, is part of the section from Jesus' encounter with this Samaritan woman at the well. And I wanted to talk about some of these things that Jesus has a conversation with about this woman <clears throat> and really relate it to where we are today and things that are going on in the world around us. You know, it's as Tommy pointed out, it's the new year will be here in uh, about 13 hours. In a few minutes here in this time zone, uh, I think the time is enough where New Zealand, Australia is already into 2024, if, if I'm doing my math right. Many will spend some time reflecting on what they have done over the last year. Many will spend time making plans for next year, setting goals, setting aspirations. Uh, many will make New Year's resolutions. Many of them will break their New Year's resolution by this time tomorrow. What do we resolve to do for a world around us? When we are making plans, do we take into account the need of the community we live in, the world that we live in? And then do we do it with the right <clears throat> mindset? James would write in James chapter 4, starting in verse 13, Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city. Spend a year there. We will buy and sell and make a profit. Whereas you do not know what will happen tomorrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live, and we will do this or that. But now you boast in your arrogance, and such boasting is evil. Therefore, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. How many times do we approach life with that attitude? How many times do we approach what we plan to do with that attitude of if the Lord wills? And does our plans, do our ideas of what we want to accomplish align with what God wants us to accomplish? How many of your grandmothers used to say, if the Lord wills and the creek don't rise? You know, James doesn't talk about a creek here. How many times do we have that same mindset? How many times do we respond to people so that they understand what we want to do is in alignment with what the scripture wants us to do? Where James tells us, if the Lord wills, we will do this, and then we will go do that. 
As you think about the community we live in, Wally mentions a lot of times when he comes up here and does closing thoughts about the publication we send to this zip code here in Leavenworth. It's called House to House. And the name of that publication is actually taken from Acts chapter 20 and verse 20. When we think about the community we live in and those around us, it's part of our plans for the next year to speak to others about Jesus. Speak to them about God. For three years, three and a half years, Paul spends time in the city of Ephesus. And when you go to Acts chapter 18, or Acts chapter 17, 18, 19, you read about his second missionary journeys there. And Paul, in the city of Ephesus, for three years, is very successful. Probably more successful than he was in any other city in converting the Gentiles to Christianity. And how do we know that? Read about the effects that he has here in the city of Ephesus. It was to the point that their economy was being destroyed because people were no longer purchasing the pagan idols and participating in the, per- in the, in the pagan rituals. They had a riot. Remember the silversmiths, the craftsmen? They riot because their livelihood is gone. Because Paul was so successful. How was Paul successful in the city of Ephesus? He gives us the blueprint if we're willing to follow it. Turn to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20 and verse 17. From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. The he here is Paul. And when they had come to him, he said unto them, You know that from the first day I came to Asia, in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with tears and trials, which happened to me in the plotting of the Jews. How I kept nothing back that was helpful, but I proclaimed it to you, and I taught you publicly and from house to house. Do we want a blueprint for success in this community? Paul lays it out for us perfectly fine right here. Serve others with humility. He taught them publicly, and he taught them from house to house. There's the name of the publication right there in Acts 20 and 20, house to house. How much time do we spend teaching others, not only publicly as we do in a setting like this, but we do it with humility. We do it with the right attitude, the right mindset of others coming to Jesus. Paul's going to further extend these ideas as he goes into verse 27. Another key idea. For I have not shunned to declare to you what? The whole counsel of God. How many times have you heard people speaking, teaching, doing whatever, but then they kind of pick and choose what they want others to hear? How many times have you heard where someone just tells you, just say this prayer with me, and Jesus will come into your heart and you will be saved? They can't turn to a single scripture that tells them that. But for some reason, they do not want to preach the whole counsel of God. They don't want to profess what has to be done. I always think of in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, as Peter is standing there on the day of Pentecost, and he says that the audience around him, these people who hear his sermon on the day of Pentecost, were what? The words that we refer to in the English translation a lot of times says they were cut to the heart or they were pricked to the heart. When you go back to the original Greek that Luke wrote that in, the idea is they were terrified. He had just convicted an audience that you crucified the Son of God. They knew what had happened to their forefathers, what had happened to their ancestors when they 
disregarded the prophets. Remember the Assyrian Empire comes in, destroys, and 722 destroys the northern kingdom. They're almost completely obliterated. They never come back as a nation again. 587, Nebuchadnezzar destroys the city of Jerusalem. They're carried into captivity for 70 years. Idolatry is burned out of the heart of Israel because of that 70-year captivity. But now they have done something far worse in their mind. They crucified, they killed the Son of God. And they were terrified about what God's wrath and God's judgment was about to come upon them. And they cried out and said, what? What shall we do? And Peter told them, let's have a prayer. Right? No. Peter didn't tell these people, just say a prayer and Jesus is going to save you. He proclaimed the whole counsel of God as Paul would tell the church in Ephesus or the, elder, the Ephesian elders here. Repent. Be baptized for the remission of sins. This is what you can do in your life. <clears throat> and then in Acts chapter 20, <clears throat> again, one more idea that Paul brings out to them. <clears throat> Therefore, in verse 31, remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Paul preached publicly from house to house, proclaimed the whole counsel of God, and he did it night and day. Is this a blueprint that we follow for ourselves around us? I was talking to uh, Tommy, I don't know, three weeks ago or so. We were having a conversation about different things. And I mentioned to him I had visited a congregation in Springfield, Missouri. It's been probably 10 years, 12 years since I have been there. But one thing that struck me, I could not tell you who spoke that morning. I could not tell you what the lesson was on. Couldn't tell you a song we sang about it. But what struck me and what has stuck in my mind was over the doors. As you are leaving their building, they have a sign hung. And it says, you are now entering a mission field. Because when Jesus told his disciples, go into all the world and preach the gospel, you know what? The world is around us. I don't have to go to Central America, South America, Africa, wherever, to say that I am in a mission field. Because the world here in Leavenworth County, in the Kansas City Metro, in the state of Missouri, in the state of Kansas, they need to hear the gospel, the truth. They need to have the whole counsel of God proclaimed to them just as much as everyone else in the world around us. Do we have that mindset of when we leave this building, we are entering a mission field? I heard a man speak one time at a funeral, and he talked about how he had never been on a mission trip. <clears throat> and that just struck me. Have you not talked to the people in the community that you live in? Because that's a mission field also for us. <clears throat> so as we think about our world around us, what attitude do we have about those in our community. Do we have the same attitude that Peter wrote in 2 Peter 3, verse 9, that God is not slack concerning his promises, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that who? any should perish, but that all should come to repentance? You know, we, we live in a world that is full of, of divisions. We live in a world that is full of a lot of times hate for others 
because they are different than us. They dress different. They talk different. They have a different skin tone than what we have. They live in a different part of the country. They live in a different nation. They vote this. They vote that. Take your pick. We find reasons to find divisions among ourselves more than I think we look for reasons to find similarities among ourselves. And really, even the Apostle Peter had to be taught an important lesson, didn't he, about looking at something far different than where someone is from or how they dress or what their nationality is. The story of Cornelius is as much about the conversion of Cornelius as it is about changing Peter's mindset and the early church's mindset about who they shared the gospel with. In Acts chapter 8, Stephen is killed at the end of Acts chapter 7. In Acts chapter 8, we're told that the church was scattered abroad and they went everywhere preaching the word, but to who? The Jews only. They hadn't yet understood the necessity of preaching to the Gentiles as well. Acts chapter 10, Peter sees the vision where, where God shows him the unclean animals coming down and he's told, rise, kill, and eat. And his response is, Lord, nothing unclean has ever entered my mouth. I'm not going to do that. And where does God send him? To the house of a Gentile. And Peter goes into this house and what is his response as he sees the Holy Spirit come upon Cornelius and those who are gathered in his house. Of a truth I perceive God is no respecter of persons. You see, sometimes we put something in our brain that this person deserves to hear the gospel more than this person deserves to hear the gospel. This person deserves salvation more than this person deserves salvation because of our own prejudice that we have built into ourselves. And it's not what God has. John chapter 4, the reason I chose this and have Tommy read this, this encounter with Jesus and this Samaritan woman at the well is because prejudices existed in the time of Jesus. The Jews felt that the Samaritans were beneath them. Why should the Samaritans receive salvation? John chapter 4, <clears throat> in verse 4, turn with me there if you're not there already, and I want you to read a verse with me. And I... Uh, I had never caught on to this until recently. It's one of these verses that I just read right past. Maybe you have too. Maybe you have caught on to it before. John 4, verse 4. But he needed to go through Samaria. It's an interesting phrase that John uses here. The word in the Greek means that he was lacking a necessity. The word needed is he was lacking a necessity to go through Samaria. Jesus planned on this encounter. Not only was he looking for to teach these Samaritans, but perhaps to teach his apostles on a lesson as they are traveling with him. And in his encounter here in Samaria, not only does he talk to a Samaritan, which would have been frowned upon by the Jewish leaders, he talks to a Samaritan woman, which would have been more of a stigma for him to do. And let's top it off with this woman is a social outcast. She's not even in the upper echelon of Samaritan woman She's down at the bottom, if we want to think of it that way, in worldly view. 
And Jesus sees an opportunity to teach someone. How many times in our life do we not look for an opportunity to teach someone because we've looked at who that person is instead of what that person needs? And if you can sit here today and tell me you've never done that, I'm going to have you tell all of us how you've done that. Because I think we all have at one point or another. And Jesus begins to talk to this woman as Tommy read. <clears throat> And it's interesting here, as this woman begins to talk to him in verse 19, she says, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worship on this mountain, and you Jews say that in Jerusalem is the place where you ought to worship. She doesn't phrase it as a question. But she is really asking Jesus a question here about worship. How do I come in contact with God? We worship here on this mountain. You say we're supposed to worship in Jerusalem. Which one is the right answer? And Jesus uses this as an opportunity to teach her something that we need to keep in mind for ourselves. The hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. And he brings out this idea, <clears throat> God is a spirit, and we must worship him in spirit and in truth. Go back to what Paul wrote, or Paul said to those Ephesian elders, the whole counsel of God. I did some looking into this word truth and the original Greek language that it's written in. And it's interesting, a lot of times when I consult these uh, <clears throat> uh, commentaries and uh, lexicons, it, it will give me more in-depth meaning of these words. And then I come up here and I share them with you. So I looked up the word truth. And I actually looked in a couple different lexicons for the word truth because I was kind of surprised by what the word means in the Greek. You may want to guess what the Greek meaning of the word truth is? Truth. That was it. <laughs> it is a direct translation from the word in the Greek for truth to our English word for truth. We have to have truth about what we worship and how we worship. And we find that in professing the whole counsel of God to others. You see, Jesus realized the need of this woman, and he sets a great example for us. He didn't know how this woman was going to respond. He didn't know he would get the... Uh, dedication out of this woman, the response out of this woman that he gets as you read down through the rest of John chapter 4, what does she do? She goes back into the city. She starts professing what Jesus had told her. She calls others from the city for them to come hear Jesus as well. And I, might, I brings to mind the parable of the sower. As the sower goes forth to sow, where does he scatter seed? Everywhere. Everywhere the sower went, he scatters, he spread the word of God. Some of it turned out very well. Some of it had no response at all. But it didn't prevent him from sowing the word of God everywhere that he went. And I think oftentimes when we look at the parable of the sower, we focus on, well, look at what happens to the good ground. And not so much as what happens as the man goes forth to sow. Paul would write 
in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. And sometimes we look, neglect that point. It is God who gives the increase. Our job is to spread the word as we go. And then the other idea you have about this is the compassion that Jesus had on this woman. Jesus knew he was talking to a Samaritan. He knew he was talking to a Samaritan woman. He knew he was talking to a Samaritan woman who was an outcast. As he begins to tell her, you don't have a husband. Matter of fact is, you've had four husbands and the man you're living with right now, he's not your husband. But it didn't stop Jesus from talking to her. You see in this story the compassion that Jesus has for others. When people talk to us, when people look at us, do we have great compassion for others? And I will tell you, my kids will back it up 100%. I'm not known as a warm, fuzzy kind of person, okay? <laughs> I know that's a shock to everybody here. <laughs> But compassion for someone else can make a tremendous difference in the life of others and give you an opportunity to share your beliefs with them. I worked with a lady 15 years ago, probably. I was her supervisor. She, uh, as far as a tech in the laboratory, she was very sound, she was very good. But she was also one that liked drama. And she liked to stir up drama in our department. And she liked it whenever she could cause some conflict. I guess it made her feel better about herself. And this was extremely frustrating as a supervisor of her because I was the one having to deal with the conflict of all these different employees. When I tell you I'm not a compassionate person, I, I, I wish Jerry was here this morning. I hope she's okay. Jerry put her hand on my shoulder a few weeks ago and I about came out of my skin, okay? I, I don't like people really touching me, uh, you know, much at all. It, it just, I'm one of those, okay? No, that is not an invitation for everybody to come start putting their hand on my shoulder just to watch Michael go, mm. <laughs> Tommy. <laughs> this woman came into my cubicle one night. Uh, we were working third shift at the time. And she began to tell me she needed, it was a, uh, I don't know if it was a Tuesday or a Wednesday morning at the time, but she needed Thursday and Friday night off that week. Very short notice. Her father had been diagnosed with throat cancer and they were doing surgery on him as quickly as possible because it was an extremely aggressive tumor growing in his throat. And as she told me this, she began to cry about her father. Very uncharacteristic of me, I reached over and I gave her a hug. And I let her just cry on my shoulder for a little bit but something happened when she saw that I had compassion for her. Her entire attitude going forward changed. I didn't have drama from her in my department anymore. She no longer works for me. She still works for the same company I work for. And I probably talk to her once every week, once every two weeks about something going on when she was first promoted to a supervisor, I was the first person she called when she had to interview others for her department to get advice and to get help with how do I do this. And that relationship with someone can change dramatically when they see compassion that we have for them. And it opens a door for us to be able to talk to people. 
the compassion that Jesus had for this woman here in John chapter 4 gave him an opportunity to not only talk to her, but this entire village. And he stays with them for two days, teaching these people because he shows compassion. Matthew chapter 14, <clears throat> starting in verse 13, Jesus hears of the death of John the Baptist. <clears throat> And he separates himself into the wilderness. We're not told why, but I have the strong suspicion that he wants time to mourn for John. And the crowd see him, and it says that he is moved with compassion for them. The word in compassion for the Greek, this one is different. The word for compassion <clears throat> means... It is the same root word that we get bowels from. You ever had that gut-wrenching feeling to do something for someone else, to take action? This is the way it is described in John or in Matthew chapter 14 that Jesus had compassion for the multitudes. He had this deep gut-wrenching feeling to take care of the needs that these people have. And you see Jesus display this over and over again. So as we think back on this year and we start to make plans for what we want to do for 2024, do we have the right mindset if the Lord wills do our goals, do our plans align with what God aligns? And then how do we view a world around us? And what plans do we make for our family, friends, neighbors, community that need to hear of the love of God? And not just to hear about the love of God. As you go down the street, you, you can see a lot of different buildings <clears throat> where people are gathered this morning. Are they professing the whole counsel of God? Are we teaching the whole counsel of God to others? I made a comment last week <clears throat> to my kids uh, that there, there were several buildings uh, last Sunday morning that had CEOs in them. Okay, these are referred to as Christmas and Easter only. How many people are in those parking lots this morning? The number of cars was drastically different in a lot of those parking lots this morning. Because many people don't understand why we truly are told to assemble together. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. We are here to encourage. We are here to support. We are here to edify one another. And there's many people in this world who need that same encouragement, same edification, same support that we can give them. We should not look at how is somebody different than me. But to remember what Paul wrote, or Paul would tell those on Mars Hill, that God created everyone from one blood. We are all the same in the eyes of God. And the one commonality that everyone on this planet has is that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And we are all in need of salvation. And everyone is deserving to hear of what God has promised for those who believe. I'll close there this morning. <clears throat> I used up some of Tommy's time that he didn't use up last week. As we close this morning, we always extend the invitation that Jesus offered. To come unto me, all of you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. As we said on the day of Pentecost, when Peter had convicted the crowd that they had crucified the Messiah, and they cry out in terror, what shall we do? 
tells them to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. If you have never made the confession that you believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and been buried in baptism, we're going to give you that opportunity to let it be known at this time. We're also here to pray for and encourage one another. If you have any needs, you can let us know as we stand and sing the song that Wally has selected for us. You know, years ago, I found a songbook that they decided they wanted to make everything really right, and they changed When We All to When the Saved. And I just, I like When We All. Let's just all be there. How's that? Um, I have one final thing. Uh, oh, I also found out Michael and I have a whole lot in, in common that uh, I don't like people touching me either. Ha, you know. <laughs> A song came out a while back that was quite unique at the time called The Wait. It was uh, by a new group called The Band. It chronicled someone taking a trip to town and being asked to do things for a myriad of people. Take a load off Fanny, take a load for free, take a load off Fanny, put the load right on me. Friends and acquaintances asking for help without offering recompense. We often have that happen in our lives. Just doesn't seem fair, giving without getting. All I ask you to do is check this out. May, Matthew chapter 26, verse 42. Then Jesus left them a second time and prayed, My Father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will will be done. Jesus took the weight of the world and replaced hopelessness, hopelessness with hope. He replaced despair with grace. He replaced our sin with his love. What a beautiful story. Let's have a prayer. Our Lord, we thank you so much. You've done so much for us. You've been there when we need you. You've taken the load away from us. Lord, help us to realize we have responsibilities to, to take care of others, to be there for others, even when it doesn't seem fair. Lord, be with us through this day and through our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.